if a man dies, shall he live again? What does it mean to be absent from the body and present with the Lord? Did Jesus go with a thief to paradise on Good Friday? Did the souls of dead people really cry out from below the altar? Pastor Bohr answers these questions and more in the amazing series. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, what a joy it is to be in your presence. We thank you, Father, for, for giving us your holy word, which is a sure guide in a world that is totally confused about so many things. And Father, as we study today about that passage in 1 Peter 3, about the preaching of Jesus to the spirits in prison, we ask for divine wisdom. I ask, Lord, that you will take away from our minds and from our hearts any preconceived notions that we might have, and that we might be willing to listen to your voice. We thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. As I mentioned in my prayer, we're going to study today that famous passage about preaching to the spirits in prison. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verses 18 to 22. What I want to do first of all is read this passage and then we are going to take a closer look at several of the details that we find in this passage. 1 Peter chapter 3 and beginning with verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an anti-type which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to Him. This is the famous passage of the preaching to the spirits in prison. Now allow me to tell you a few introductory things about the two epistles that Peter wrote. First of all, I want us to notice that these epistles were not written for theologians. They were not written for philosophers. They were written by common, for common ordinary Christians. In other words, they have a practical purpose. They can be understood by the layperson in the pew. And Peter wrote these things to bring encouragement in the midst of trials and tribulations and suffering. So this passage, even though it is complex, it can not only be understood by theologians, it can be understood and applied to the life by the common ordinary church member. I want you to notice in 1 Peter chapter 1 who this epistle is directed to. 1 Peter 1 and verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. 
elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ grace to you and peace be multiplied to you. So notice he's writing to the Jews primarily who are in the diaspora in other words in the dispersion. He's writing to common ordinary Christians. Now there's a common misunderstanding of this passage. I want to read now the way many Christians read this passage, or read things into this passage. This is the way they read it. While the body of Jesus was dead, His soul went down to hell. And he preached the good news of salvation to the spirits of dead people who disobeyed at the time of the flood in order to give them a second chance to be saved. That's the way that many Christians read this passage. But they're actually reading into the passage what is not there. Nowhere do you find here any reference to the word soul. You find no reference to Jesus going down. You find no reference to Jesus preaching the gospel. You find no reference that the spirits are spirits of dead people. And you find no reference of a second chance. Now I want to give you several reasons why Jesus could not have preached to the disincarnated spirits of the dead. Number one, the Bible teaches that there will not be another chance to be saved after you die. A second chance. Notice Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 where this is made absolutely crystal clear. Hebrews 9 and verse 27. It says there, and as it is appointed for men to die, what? Once. But after this, the judgment. What comes after a person dies? The judgment, according to Scripture. No idea that you can die, and then have the gospel preached to you, and you can be saved, and then after that, you're judged. The fact is, you live once, and after you live, you have the judgment. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not two or three thousand years down the road after your death. The Bible says, if you hear His voice today, do not harden your heart. In other words, while we are alive is when we can make decisions for salvation. Furthermore, we're told in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 5 the following, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So if the dead don't know anything, how is it that Jesus supposedly went to preach to the spirits in prison? If it is appointed for an individual to die, and after that the judgment, how could they have been preached to after the judgment? If the Bible says, if you hear His voice today, do not harden your heart. If the Bible says, today is the day of salvation, how is it that they could be saved, supposedly, after they've died? Furthermore, the Bible is very clear that that generation of people who lived before the flood were irreversible. Now if they couldn't be reached with the gospel while they were alive, why suddenly would they listen to the preaching after they were dead? Notice Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 speaking about that pre-flood race. It says there, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. 
Basically, this is speaking about a race that had become totally degenerate. And the book of Genesis makes it clear that when the door of the ark closed, that was it for those who lived in this period before the flood. So the idea that somehow later on Jesus goes and preaches to these spirits of dead people many thousands of years later does not square at all with the condition that they were in before the flood. Which means that they had committed the unpardonable sin. They were irreversible. So how could they be reached? How could they respond to the gospel after they were dead? It's simply not possible. Now I'd like us to go specifically to the passage 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 and the first thing that I want us to notice is the structure of verse 18. How it is organized, the literary structure of verse 18. We have actually here a synonymous parallelism. The first half of the verse is explained in the second half of the verse. It says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might what? Bring us to God. Let me ask you, would he have to be alive to bring us to God? Of course he would. So what this is saying is that Jesus suffered and died for our sins so that he could resurrect and he could what? Bring us to God. That is explained in the second half of the verse, explicitly. It says, being put to death in the flesh, is that parallel to suffered once for our sins? Yes, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Is that the same as that He might bring us to God? Absolutely. So you have a parallel in this verse. Christ suffered for sins, which is the same as being put to death in the flesh. That He might bring us to God is the same as made alive by the Spirit. Now we need to understand what is meant here by being put to death in the flesh. What does that mean, being put to death in the flesh? What does the word flesh there mean? It's speaking about the tent that we spoke about in our last lecture. It's speaking about this body which was subject to mortality. It was subject to death. Notice Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7 where this is explicitly said. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7. It says here, speaking about Jesus, who in the days of His flesh, does that mean while He was on this earth? before His death and resurrection? Absolutely. Who in the days of His flesh, when He had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to Him who was able to save Him from death and was heard because of His godly fear. So we find that put to death in the flesh means that His human nature, which was subject to to weakness, and it was subject to death, when he was crucified, died. His tent, if you please, the, the body which was mortal and subject to weakness. But what does it mean that he was made alive by the Spirit? I prefer the translation, I'll tell you the reason why in a few moments, the translation in the King James Version where it says, made alive in the Spirit. Now what does that mean, made alive in the Spirit? Put to death in the flesh means that his tent or his body, mortal body, weak body, died and went to the grave. But what does it mean when it says, made alive in the Spirit? Well, go with me to Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, who raised Jesus from the dead? The Spirit according to this, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, 
He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your what? Mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So what does it mean being made alive in the Spirit? It's speaking about the what? The resurrection of Jesus through the power of whom? Of the Holy Spirit. So are these the two same states of existence that are expressed by the tent and the building that we studied last night? Absolutely. In other words, He died and He resurrected is what it's saying. Notice also 1 Corinthians 15 in verses 42 to 44 on this very important aspect. What it means to be put to death in the flesh and resurrect in the Spirit or being made alive in the Spirit. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 42, So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. Is that the tent? Yes? Is that being put to death in the flesh? Absolutely. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised how? In incorruption. Is that the building that we receive from God at the moment of the resurrection? Absolutely. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised how? In glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. You understanding what it means to be resurrected in the Spirit or getting life in the Spirit? It means that the Holy Spirit resurrects the person and gives that person the building that God has prepared in heaven. And so the Apostle Paul says there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So are you understanding 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18? It's simply saying that Jesus suffered once for our sins, which is the same thing as saying that He was put to death in the flesh. But then it says that He might bring us to God, and the way that He could do this is He was made alive, how? In the Spirit. Now we need to look a little bit at the grammar of chapter 3 and verse 19. And you know, I debate on whether to touch the issue of grammar. But in this particular case, it is extremely important for un us to understand the grammar in Greek of 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 19. Now let me ask you, must there be an agreement between the noun and the pronoun? Those of you who know about English know that the pronoun and the noun have to agree. Now the problem in English is that our pronouns basically have one form. Right? And they're distinguished by gender. But in Greek you have what are called cases. A noun can be in the nominative case, it can be in the accusative case, it can be in the genitive case, or it can be in the accusative case. And each case has a different ending for that Greek word. Which means that the pronoun and the noun have to have the same ending in that case. Are you understanding a little bit of what I'm saying? Yes. Now the reason I'm saying this is because the expression in the flesh, this is very important, the expression in the flesh is in the dative case. And I see Jonathan saying, yeah, remember my Greek because he's just come back from college. In the flesh is in the dative case. The ending, actually in Greek it is en sarki. Not sarkis, en sarki. The expression in the spirit is also in the dative case. En pneumati. 
Det er en i. The interesting thing is that the expression that is used in which verse 19 says by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison you'll notice that in the King James it doesn't say by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison it actually says in which he went and preached to the spirits in prison in the King James that's a better translation because that expression in which which is a relative pronoun is also in the dative case so you have the noun flesh you have the noun spirit and you have the relative pronoun in which all agreeing in the same case what does that mean? in practical terms it means that when verse 19 says in which or in which state he went and preached to the spirits in prison you have to look at the nouns that come before the expression in which in which what? well he was put to death in the flesh dative case he was made alive in the spirit dative case in which dative case he went and preached to the spirits in prison let me ask you when it says then in which he went he went how? after he what? after he died and he resurrected are you following me? now if you don't know English grammar you're in trouble the best way to learn another language is by knowing the grammar of your own language it's much easier to learn a language that way but once again I underline that the word flesh, the word spirit and the expression in which are all in the same case, they're all in the dative case which means that the expression in which which is translated in the New King James by which refers back to dying in the flesh and being resurrected in the spirit so how did Jesus go to preach to the spirits in prison? he went after he died and what? and resurrected which means that he did not go there when he died at all are you with me? Amen. now let's take a look at some of the words in this verse in which state in which resurrected state he went went that's the Greek word poriuthes it is used for going up down or horizontally for example it's used to say that the Apostle Paul went to Damascus so that's horizontal going it's also used to speak about going down but it's also used to speak about going up the problem is that here it simply says he went and so most Christians assume he went down to hell to preach to the spirits they're putting in the text what is not in the text the question is where did Jesus go? did he necessarily go down? no he could have gone what? up in fact let's notice a verse in Acts chapter 1 and verse 10 that speaks about the ascension of Jesus and the word go or the, use, the word went is referring not to going down but to his ascension to heaven notice Acts chapter 1 and verse 10 and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he what? went, that's the same word, poriuthes, went up behold two men stood by them in white apparel so the word went can refer to Jesus going up not necessarily going down 
In fact, the context indicates that that's the way that the word went should be translated. You say, how's that? Go with me to verses 21 and 22 of 1 Peter 3. It says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the last part of verse 21. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Talking about the resurrection, right? Yes. Who has gone... I bet you can't guess what word that is. Poriuthes. The very word. In the same context. It says, who has gone down to hell? No. Who has gone where? Into heaven. And is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to Him. I want you to remember those angels, authorities and powers because we're going to come back to those a little bit later on. So according to the immediately succeeding context, where did Jesus go? He went, but He didn't go down. He went where? Up to heaven. Very same word. Now what does this text mean when it says that He went and preached? Christians add an expression. They say, He went and He preached the good news of the gospel. Where do you find the good, good news of the gospel in that passage? It's not there. It's an assumption that people make. Do you know that the word keruso in Greek, which means to preach, does not necessarily always mean preach. It is used in the New Testament in the sense of proclaimed or announced. Let's notice a couple of examples. Revelation 5 verse 2. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 2. This is speaking about the scene where there's one seated on the throne and he has a scroll in his hand. It says there in verse 2, Then I saw a strong angel, what? Proclaiming, that's the same word, carousel. Proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? So the word carousel can mean also to what? To proclaim or to announce. Notice one other example. Luke 8 and verse 39. Luke chapter 8 and verse 39. This is after Jesus has cast out the demons from the men of Gadara. And He says to them, return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And He went His way and what? And proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. He went, he proclaimed, and he announced the greatness and glory of Jesus. So it does not necessarily mean the preaching of the gospel. That's an assumption. It's an assumption that Jesus went down. It's an assumption that he preached the gospel. Now what about the spirits in prison? Some people say, well, the spirits in prison are the spirits of the dead. That's not what the Bible teaches. All you have to do is look up the word spirits in the New Testament. Let's notice a few verses that speak about spirits. These spirits are not spirits of human beings at all. They're evil spirits. Let's read the text. Luke 10 and verse 20. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. What spirits are being spoken about there? Demons. But rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Luke 11, 24 to 26. Let's notice what the word spirits means. Luke 11, 24 to 26. When an unclean spirit goes, goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest, and finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits. Is this talking about evil spirits, demons? Absolutely. 
more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Let's read one more. Mark chapter 1 and verses 27 and 28. Mark 1, 27 and 28. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the what? The unclean spirits, and they obey him. So what are the spirits? Demons. So you're saying, Pastor, are you saying that Jesus preached the gospel to demons? No, because the word preach does not necessarily mean preach the gospel. We're going to come to that a little bit later on. Now it speaks here about the spirits in prison. Now in the New Testament, who are the spirits that are uniformly spoken of as being in prison? Fallen angels. Let's read some verses. Let's start with the leader of all the evil spirits. Who's that? The devil. Notice Revelation 20 and verses 1 and 3. Revelation 20 verses 1 and 3. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit. Actually it's to the abyss. And a great what? Chain in his hand. Verse 3, And he cast him, that is the devil, into the bottomless pit or the abyss. And what did he do? He shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. And by the way, in verse 7, if you want to read verse 7, I won't do it, it says that at the end of the thousand years, Satan, who was chained, will be released from his prison. Spirits in prison. Spirits are demons. And they're spoken of, at least the leader to this point, is spoken of as being where? In prison. Now let's go to a couple of other verses. Jude 6. Jude 6. Speaking about the evil angels, it says, And the angels, who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in what? everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Who are the ones who are in everlasting chains? The wicked angels. Notice Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for the judgment. So let me ask you, who are the spirits that are in prison or the spirits that are chained? They are fallen angels. So here it's saying that Jesus proclaimed something to the evil spirits or to the fallen angels. When He what? When He resurrected. Because he was put to death in the flesh, he was resurrected in the spirit, and in that state he went and he preached to the spirits in prison. If God had wanted to say that he preached to the spirits in prison after he died, it would have said, he was put to death in the flesh, he went and preached to the spirits in prison, and then he was made alive by the spirit. But the antecedent shows that he was put to death in the flesh, he resurrected in the spirit, and in this state he went and he proclaimed something to Satan and his angels. The question is, what did he proclaim to Satan and his angels? Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 22. When Jesus goes to heaven, when Jesus ascends to heaven, when He resurrects, there are powers that are made what? Subject to Him. Notice. Who has gone into heaven. So He didn't go down, He went what? Up. Who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. And now notice. Angels 
and authorities and powers having been made what? subject to him. Let me ask you, who are those angels, authorities, and powers? There are other texts in the New Testament that indicate that these are evil angels, authorities, and powers. You say, where is that? Go to Matthew 12, 28 and 29. Are you starting to catch a picture here? Matthew chapter 12 verses 28 and 29. Here Jesus says, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or, how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods? Who is the strong man here? The devil. Unless he first what? Binds the strong man, and then he will what? He will plunder his house. By the way, at the cross of Calvary, did Jesus ransack the house of the enemy? Did Jesus take over the dominion and rulership of the world legally? Was the devil cast out of heaven as the prince of this world and the representative of this world? Yes, he was exiled. Notice what we find in John chapter 12 verses 30 and 31. John 12, 30 and 31. Here Jesus says, now is the judgment of this world. This is shortly before his death. Now the ruler of this world will be what? Cast out. Let me ask you, could the devil go to heaven representing this world before the cross? Sure he could. Read the book of Job. Read 2 Chronicles chapter 18 verses 18 uh, to 20 to 22. It says that whenever there was a heavenly council in heaven, Satan went representing planet earth because he had taken away the throne from Adam. But when Jesus overcame the devil on the cross, Satan was cast out as the ruler of this world. And now Jesus represents planet earth. The devil has been exiled and he is bound to this planet, to planet earth, as a result of what Jesus has done. That's why Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I love that. I mean, how fast is lightning? I mean, this was a fast fall, whoa, all the way down. But the struggle was great, wasn't it? The Bible calls this the hour of the powers of darkness when Jesus went through his trials in Gethsemane and on the cross. You can hear Jesus saying, My Father, if this cup can pass from me, let it be so. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. Ellen White says that the destiny of the world hung as by a thread. She says that Jesus was tempted to throw in the towel and go back to heaven and allow the human race to perish. In that case Satan would have been the ruler of this world indefinitely. She says that, that the devil tortured Jesus with temptations to try and get him to fall. We can hear the agony in the voice of Jesus when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We can hear the agony when Jesus said, It is finished. We can hear the agony when Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. When Jesus died on Friday and said, It is finished, the devil knew that his kingdom was finished. And when Jesus resurrected, Jesus came out of the grave and he proclaimed his victory over the evil spirits. Allow me to read you here a passage that we find in the Desire of Ages, page 780. Desire of Ages 780 on the resurrection of Jesus. Ellen White says this, Hosts of evil angels were gathered about the place. That is the tomb of Jesus. Then she describes, these are not her words but mine, I'm, I'm just shortening her statements. Then she describes how Gabriel descends to the tomb in these words. The earth trembles at his approach. The hosts of darkness flee. 
And as he rolls away the stone, heaven seems to come down to the earth. The soldiers see him removing the stone as he would a pebble. And hear him cry, Son of God, come forth. The Father calls thee. They see, see Jesus come forth from the grave. And hear him proclaim over the rent sepulcher, I am the resurrection and the life. What is Jesus proclaiming when He comes up from the tomb and when He ascends to heaven? He's proclaiming His victory over the spirits in prison, over the devil and over His angels. You say, now pastor, you're saying the authorities, principalities, and powers, and angels that are spoken of there in 1 Peter chapter 3 is referring to evil powers? Absolutely. Let's read some verses. Go with me to Colossians chapter 2 and verses 14 and 15. Colossians chapter 2 and verses 14 and 15. And you're going to notice immediately similar term terminology to what we read in 1 Peter 3. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made what? Alive together with him. Is that the same terminology we notice in 1 Peter 3? Put to death in the flesh but made alive by what? By the Spirit. Here it says, you who were dead in your trespasses, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, He has made alive together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the what? To the cross. And now notice this. Having what? Disarmed. What did he do through the cross? What does it mean to disarm? Their weapons are removed. Having disarmed what? Principalities and powers. He made a what? A public spectacle of them. Triumphing over them in it that is in the cross. Did he make a public spectacle of them when he came out and said, I am the resurrection of the, and the life? Yes, the evil spirits scattered. The Roman soldiers fell as if they were dead. Notice Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. Chapter 8, 38 and 39. Once again, speaking about principalities and powers. Here the Apostle Paul says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, and then later on in the verse he says, can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me ask you, if these were good angels, and good principalities, and good powers, why would they want to separate us from the Lord? Are you with me? Amen. Notice Ephesians 6 verse 12. Time and again this comes through. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. Here the Apostle Paul says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness. Where? In heavenly places. What did Jesus do when He ascended to heaven? He proclaimed His what? He proclaimed His victory over Satan and over His angels. In other words, he went down when he died, but when he resurrected, he went up. Notice Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 8 through 10. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Therefore, he says, When he ascended high, he led captivity captive. By the way, that's speaking about those who resurrected with Jesus. You can read it in Matthew 27, 51 to 53. They were captives of the grave. And what did Jesus do? Jesus ransacked the grave. Who had the keys before this? The prince of evil. Now Jesus goes in, he grabs the keys, and he opens the graves. And it says, and he gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first, what? Descended into the lower parts of the earth. In other words, he was buried. He who descended is also the one who what? Who ascended far above all the heavens that he might 
fill all things. So let's summarize. Jesus died. He resurrected. He ascended. And as He ascended, He proclaimed His what? He proclaimed His victory over Satan and his angels. And Satan was cast out of heaven as a representative of this world, and he was earthbound. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 4 through 6. Ephesians 2 verses 4 through 6. This is another passage that is parallel to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. Notice, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were, what? Dead. Like Jesus, right? Dead in trespasses and sins. He was dead because of our sins. Made us, what? Alive. Together with whom? With Christ. By grace you have been saved. And then what did He do? He made us alive, and what? Raised us up together. And made us what? Sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do we go through the same process that Jesus went through? Died? Resurrected? Ascended? and sat at the right hand of God. You say, I'm not at the right hand of God. I'm in Fresno Central Church. But through Jesus, we sit at the right hand of God. We have died with Him. We have been buried with Him. We have resurrected with Him. We have ascended with Him. And we are seated at the right hand of God with Him. That's why the beautiful thing is, we don't have to worry about what God thinks of us. We have to worry about what God thinks about Jesus, our substitute. So in other words, Peter is saying, the experience that Jesus went through is the same experience that we go through in Him. Is He trying to encourage the people there? He most certainly is. Let's read one other verse. Romans chapter 6 and verses 3 and 5 on this specific point of sharing in the experience of Jesus through Him. It says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into what? His death. When is it that we benefit from everything that Jesus did? When we're what? When we're baptized. See, when we're baptized, this is the wonderful thing. When we're baptized, we die. We're buried in the water. We come out of the water. We resurrect the newness of life. And then Jesus says, this is my beloved son. We sit with Jesus in heavenly places. Verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now you'll notice one further thing in this passage. It speaks about the flood in Noah's day being a type or a symbol of the experience that Jesus went through and the experience that we go through when we are baptized. Now let's take a look at that. Jesus came to this world. He suffered reproach. He died. By the way, he spoke about his death as a baptism. Can you be baptized with the baptism that I will be baptized with? Jesus asked. His death was a baptism. And then he came forth to newness of life, victorious over all of his oppressors. And he sat at the right hand of God. The flood is used as an illustration of this. You see, in the days of Noah, Noah was sorely oppressed by his enemies in that old sinful world. But Peter is saying that Noah and his family entered the ark and they went through the what? They went through the waters, which symbolizes baptism. And when they came out on the other side of the waters, what happened with all of their oppressors? 
All of their oppressors had been buried. All of their old life had been buried in the waters. And they came out to a new world. That's the reason why the Apostle Peter is using this illustration of the flood. He's saying that as Noah was oppressed, but he went into the ark, went through the waters, and came out the other side with all of his oppressors being buried, all of his old life being buried, and coming out to a new world. That's what happened with Jesus. Jesus was also sorely oppressed. He was put to death in the flesh. He experienced the baptism of death. But he also came out on the other side of death, having buried his old life, so to speak, left it in the tomb, and came forth on the other side, new. And then Peter wants to apply it also to us. The Apostle Peter says, the experience that Noah went through is, this, is an illustration of the experience that Jesus went through and the experience that Jesus went through is also an illustration of what we go through when we die to sin, when our sin is buried in the waters, when we resurrect to newness of life after our old life has been buried in the waters, and when we ascend, figuratively speaking, and sit where? And sit at the right hand of God. You see, the problem in Peter's day is that the church was being sorely afflicted and oppressed. I'm going to read it in a moment. They were about to give up Christianity. They were saying it's not worth it. Too many trials, too many tribulations. Our enemies are after it, after us. We're being afflicted. We're dying. We're being persecuted. Jesus says, don't worry. You see, Jesus went through the same thing. He gained the victory. And if you're in Him, it doesn't make any difference. You can gain the victory as well. Let's read this. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verses 13 to 17. Here the Apostle Peter explains why he is giving this passage. It's not some theological passage. The purpose is practical. 1 Peter 3, 13. And who is he who will harm you? See, they were being harmed. If you become followers of what is good, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. Was Jesus blessed? Yes. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Is that what Noah went through? Is that what Jesus went through? He said, don't worry about it. It's happened before. Been there, done that. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Is that what happened with the devil and his angels? Oh yes. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Let's read one more passage before we close. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verses 12 and 13. Here Peter expresses the practical purpose for his theology. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verses 12 and 13. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. In other words, don't think that your trials and tribulations are really some weird, strange thing that has never happened before. But rejoice to the extent that you, what? There's a key word. That you partake of Christ's suffering. Is that the part where he's oppressed and he's put to death in the flesh? Yes. You partake of Christ's sufferings. Now notice this, the promise. That when His glory is revealed. When is that? When Jesus comes. You may also be what? Glad with exceeding joy. Is this a magnificent passage? 
it has been totally misinterpreted by Christians to give the idea that Jesus went down to hell and he preached to all of these disincarnated spirits who sinned at the time of the flood. He preached the gospel to them, giving them a second chance to be saved. Where is that in all of this passage? Nowhere. It's an assumption. It's injecting into the text what is not in the text. And it's done with the thief on the cross, it's done with the witch of Endor, it's done with absent from the body and present with the Lord, it's done with the apostles' desire to depart and be with the Lord, it's done with the, with, with the dead who stand before God, the souls that cry from under the altar, which are passages that we're going to study. You see, if we study these passages carefully, we discover that they are not teaching what people say they are teaching when you allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. I'd like to bring this to a conclusion by reading 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. Here the Apostle Paul has the same sequence. Suffering, victory. There is no suffering, there is no victory without what? Suffering. We must partake of the sufferings of Christ. We must go through His experience. Do we have the benefit of His example? When we're going through suffering, Jesus went through and He came out victoriously, not a problem. 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. For if we died with Him, we shall also live with Him. Is that a beautiful promise? If we endure, that is, if we persevere in the midst of sufferings, we shall also reign with Him. That's a marvelous promise, isn't it? And the promises of God are given to us for us to claim them. So don't get discouraged when you suffer, when you go through trials and tribulations. Just remember that you're just partaking of what happened to Christ. And if we suffer with Him, the Bible says that we shall also reign with Him. Are we looking forward to the day when Jesus comes and we shall reign with Him? And then we'll ascend to heaven where all of the wicked powers scatter and Jesus will proclaim His final victory over the principalities and the powers.